so good to be back. I want to thank Pastor Obed for bringing the Word of God last week. Did you guys enjoy Pastor Obed? Amazing leader, phenomenal Bible teacher, and uh, just a great friend of our house. But excited to be back. We were in Colorado last week and uh, got off the plane in Orange County. And I remembered that everywhere else in America is freezing right now. And I just thought, Lord, thank you for good weather. That's why we pay so much for ugly houses. But... Um, Glad you're here today. If I haven't met you before, my name is Mark, and we're going to have a good time. I'm going to open up the Bible every week at Ocean's Church. We, we read the, the Word of God. We believe that God speaks in many ways, but His predominant way of speaking is through the, the Bible. If you want to know the mind of God, then you read the Word of God. And today we're going to read it. Maybe this is new for some of you guys. I'm going to actually read a pretty well-known. Maybe you've never been to church your whole life, and I would go on the record to say that you've probably heard this story before. It is probably the most iconic story of the entire Old Testament. It is a story of a, a guy named David and a giant named... Lion. You got it. Sunday school, right? But before I get into that, I, I was trying to shake away from the series uh, and start getting ready for what's next. We might start a new series next week, but I just couldn't shake it this week. I felt like there was some unfinished business to have. We've been in a series called Training Shepherds or Shepherd Training. Have you guys gotten anything out of this series so far? I'm so excited. I'm already seeing it in our church. I'm seeing businessmen and businesswomen becoming great shepherds. Two weeks ago, my friend Carlo, who is right here in the fifth or sixth row. Carlo, stand up real quick. Show everybody how great your beard is today. This is Carlo. Carlo, two Sundays ago, was heading to a Super Bowl party at another person in our church's house. And on the way there, he had a heart attack. They called the ambulance. The ambulance would pick him up. And his wife, literally, the, the, the small group rallied around him. Cody Novini, many others were there. And in the ambulance, Carlo looks at the two EMTs and he says, you guys are getting ready to see a miracle. He's so full of faith. He was high on God. And he said, what he didn't realize was, he said, I started to fade. And as soon as I faded out, we'll get a story documented that we'll show on the screens. But he said he faded out like he was going to sleep. And as soon as it happened, he said it felt like a second, but he said he saw the face of Jesus, and he said he heard his voice. True story. He said, he said, uh, wake up, son. That's what it was. Jesus said, wake up, son. And when he did, he came back. And when he opened his eyes, he said the two EMTs about jumped out of their skins. <laughs> the EMTs are actually here today, I think. They're up front. Where are you at, EMTs? Saving lives right here. That's awesome. Thanks for being here. True story. It's a true story right here. Our church loves that you're here today. This is awesome, man. Well done, man. Way to save a life. So these guys were working on Carlo. I just heard the story secondhand. They're, they're working on Carlo, but I guess he was gone for a little bit, right? And he died two times or something. He was gone twice. And the fact that he woke up with no brain damage, woke up better than he looked before, stronger beard, I might add, I said, Carlo, that beard looks stronger than it was before. But he, uh, he ends up going to the hospital, documented miracle. I don't know if you remember two weeks ago, Super Bowl Sunday, but we prayed, Lord, do something today that would be better than the game. I want to let you know, that was a good Super Bowl game. But that was even better than the Super Bowl, Carlo. Bunch of shepherds in our church, man. So, so happy that you're here, Carlo. But just powerful, man. If you don't believe that God is real, Carlo met him two weeks ago. He <laughs> talked to Carlo. That's a true story. He'll tell you. This dude's been on fire. He's telling everybody about God. You meet with God, and you know that heaven is real. It changes life. Some of you live like heaven doesn't exist. But it, what if it was real? Would it change your values? Would it change how you lived your life? My job this morning, I'm a pastor, that's what I do, I open up the Bible, I teach this book, but I want to let you know that what kind of makes this special here today is at Ocean's Church, we don't just teach the Bible, we invite the God of the Bible to meet with us. He actually still speaks. You hear voices? Yeah, I hear a voice called the Holy Spirit. It's a still small voice, and I've heard it many times, it's changed my life. I've gotten better at hearing it over the years, I'm going to talk about that today. He still speaks. I remember one time I, he, I was being with a young guy. And he just got out of this accounting school, and he hated his job. And he said, uh, I'm going to, I just, I want to quit this job. And we were actually meeting at Red Robin. A lot of Red Robin today. Come on. <laughs> we're Red Robin. I felt the dirty bird anointing in here. And uh, 
I'm in with him, and he's like, I hate my job. And I just said, I said, name's David. I said, David, um, I, I don't know why. And I just, I saw and I heard God's voice. It was a feeling, and I heard it. And I, I just found out about a company called bodybuilding.com. This is like probably, I don't know, seven, eight years ago, 10 years ago. And uh, I remember sitting down, and the Holy Spirit said, Mark, tell him that he's going to become the next CFO of bodybuilding.com. Yeah. Tell him that he's going to promote quickly. And then in, in a few years' time, he'd be the CFO of bodybuilding.com. And tell him after he becomes a CFO, other Fortune 500 companies would actually chase him down, would actually hire him, and he would have a prolific career in business and in the kingdom of God. So I told him that, and I felt the grace of God. He starts crying, the presence of God hits that table right above the onion rings. And true story, he goes home that day, his wife cuts hair, and his wife goes, I got good news to tell you, David. He goes, I have good news. She said, uh... Well, I'll go first. She says, I was cutting a lady's hair today, and I told her that you hate your job at this accounting firm. And she said that her husband's hiring at his job right now, yeah. hiring accountants. He says, that's great. Where does she work? Bodybuilding.com. Yeah. He starts working at bodybuilding.com 48 hours later. I told this story five years ago when we started our church. I told it a couple times. He actually worked at bodybuilding.com for like seven, eight years. Took another job as a controller at another company. Got let go a month and a half later. Got rehired as the president of finance. Became the CFO. Did that for a season and is now a CFO of a big company in San Diego. Is that coincidence? Or do we hear voices? The Holy Spirit speaks. Who's up for hearing God today? Anybody up for hearing God if he speaks? Yeah, okay. All right, so... Let's make that out of the way. Got your Bible this morning. We have a lot of, long way to go, short time to get there. Psalms chapter 78. We've been in a series called Training Shepherds. The idea is, is God's greatest desire, you look in the New Testament, that really bothered God was that there was a lot of sheep that had no shepherds. It says he wept because he had a nation of people that were wandering. Wandering is not because people are evil. Usually sheep wander because they're hungry. Some you've been wandering to clubs because you're hungry for satisfaction. You've been hungering for relationships. You've been, you've, been, you've been all these wandering places, drugs, alcohol. You've been doing all kinds of things, affairs, all kinds of things. And I would go on the record to say that maybe you weren't that bad of a person. Maybe you're trying to satisfy your appetite in the wrong place. And I believe the solution to a wandering county is men and women that know God, that know how to shepherd. God has always loved shepherds. Abraham was a shepherd. Isaac was a shepherd. Jacob was a shepherd. His 11 sons were shepherds. Moses was a shepherd. And today we're going to read about one of the greatest shepherds in history. His name was David. Yeah. David is a type and a shadow of Jesus Christ. Many parallels if you study the life of Jesus and the life of King David. David is the one that killed Goliath. We're going to read it today. But David was 30 years old when he became king. And Jesus was 30 years old when he started his earthly ministry. A lot of parallels. But we know about David is David wasn't just a king. The Bible calls him a shepherd king. I want to talk to you today about being a shepherd king. It's a kind of an oxymoron, honestly, because in the ancient world, being a shepherd was like a really lousy job. It's what you gave your kids to do when you're mad at your kids. Go take care of those stinky sheep. It was basically animal, uh, animal babysitting. And this, this kid, David, he's a king. They call him the shepherd king. That's like saying the really gross, classy guy. Bad analogy. Tough crowd. Okay, we better keep going. But today, uh, I want to talk to you because I really felt the heart of God saying, there's Goliaths in this county. There's Goliaths in our land. There's Goliaths in your own family. I would go on the record to say there's Goliaths probably in your family lineage. Today there is something that's taunting you, something that's saying that you're going to go down, something that's, gonna, that's, that's dictating that your potential is limited, that God isn't that good, and there's no chance of things changing or getting better in the future. You are the way you are. The way you were born is the way that you have to die. Contrary to popular opinion, we believe in a God that has, gives us a second birth, a second chance. That I was born looking like my mom and my dad, but I died looking like what I worshiped in life. And we're going to make a conscious decision to say, God, today I invite you to be my shepherd king. David was a great king because he was a great shepherd. 
And I actually believe he's a great shepherd because in the heart of every king is a great shepherd. In the heart of every great shepherd, there is a king. You guys ready to go today? So I want to lay this out, but I want to talk to you in the subject matter today. Crazy or crazy love? I actually believe if you do what God made you to do in your world, there's people dying in families because they don't know how to shepherd their children. They don't know how to be a good shepherd of their spouse. They don't know how to be a good shepherd of their employees. People quitting because they don't like working with you because you don't know how to take care of them. Shepherds do two things. Shepherds lead. Shepherds feed. What do they do? They what? Lead. And they and I'm telling you that people wander because they're not being led. And people wander because they're not being fed. And I believe the reason why you're sitting here today is God wants you to know the great shepherd, the chief shepherd, the good shepherd. And as you know him, you start taking on his nature. And you know what he's really good at? Leading us and feeding us. You guys ready to go today? I want, you to, I want to focus on this first, first verse today, Psalms chapter 78. It says in verse 70 and following, it says, He chose David his servant. Who did he choose? David. I need Ocean's Church to lean in this morning. Who did he choose? David. He took him from the sheepfolds. He didn't take him from the White House. He didn't take him from, from Oxford. Did you guys know I went to Oxford? I went there in November to have lunch with a friend. It was great. He didn't pick him from Oxford or Yale. It says that he pulled him out of the sheepfolds. He says from following the lambs he had brought to him to shepherd Jacob his people and Israel his inheritance. Well, verse 72 is what I want you to focus in. God gave me this really powerful revelation today. So he shepherded them according to the integrity of his heart. How do we shepherd? How do we lead? How do we feed? Out of the what? It's the integrity of our heart. That makes us a great shepherd. I would actually say it's not the skill of the shepherd. It's the integrity of the shepherd that determines how well the sheep eat. Problem with churches that have, health, that have unhealthy people in them, they're being led by unhealthy pastors. I'm not claiming to be perfect, but I am claiming this, that I'm on a pursuit to be integrous. Integrity is how the, the shepherd actually shepherds the flock is the integrity of his heart. And he goes on. And he guided them by the skillfulness of his hands. So he fed them with his integrity, but he guided them with the skill of his hands. I want to go on the record today to say that if you want to be a great shepherd like God, like Jesus in your world, you got to learn how to actually value integrity, and you got to invest in developing your skills. Are you guys ready to go today? There's a story that actually demonstrates both, uh, both David's integrity and his skill. The story is found in 1 Samuel chapter 17. I almost don't even want to preach out of it. It's been preached out of so many, so many times. Sunday school, so many times. One of the most iconic stories. I'm not going to focus on the fact that, that David killed Goliath. I'm not going to focus on the fact that this guy was 10 feet tall. He was an undrafted pick for the NBA. I'm not going to focus on the fact that he talked more trash than a, than a city league basketball game. I'm not here to talk about any of that. I'm not here to say that he was wearing 100 pounds of armor, that he had a spear the size of a, we, a, a, spear the size of a weaver's beam. And I have no idea how big that is. I'm assuming it's huge. I'm not here to talk about that. I'm not here to say that he taunted Israel for 40 days. 40 days he taunts the king who Saul is the tallest person in Israel. It says he was shoulders taller than the next tallest guy. So if you were going size by size, Saul should have fought Goliath. And it wasn't even Abner, his great general, that was a mighty man. And it wasn't David's three brothers that were in the military that were all big, all strong, and all gifted. What we know is it doesn't matter how big you are, strong you are, gifted you are. What do the soldiers, the brothers, and the king all have in common? None of them were talking about God. None of them. They were all talking about Goliath. David shows up delivering some barley, ten cheeses. That's pizza. David is the original pizza delivery man. His dad said, son, take this pizza to your brother's. He puts the barley, he puts the cheese in a basket. He goes to the battlefield not knowing it's a battlefield. He shows up there. He hears a 10-foot guy saying, he says, you, you pick your greatest warrior to fight me. If he wins, all of our nation will serve the Jews. 
But if I win, all of the Jews will serve the Philistines. And literally, they're at a deadlock. No one wants to fight Goliath. He's huge. So the story goes that David shows up. He hears about it. And it, he literally, the guy said, yeah, whoever kills this guy, he's going to get rich. He's going to marry the king's daughter. And he's never going to pay taxes to the IRS the rest of his life. <laughs> David said, what was that last thing he said? <laughs> David goes, who is this uncircumcised? That's crazy talk right there. <laughs> it's insulting him in the deepest way possible. <laughs> who is this uncircumcised Philistine? That he should defy the armies of the living God. He said, I'll take this joker out myself. And he starts bragging that, look, this guy's going down. Somehow the word gets back to the king of Israel. I want to just pause here. I didn't say this last service. I want you to think about this. This is a very big deal because not only did they let David fight Goliath, you got to realize that they were putting their lives in David's hands. If David loses this fight, they're either dead or they're slaves forever. It's a big deal. But he's a teenager. Teenagers can do anything, right? I got it. And it says in uh, chapter 17, verse, verse, uh, verse 30, he turned towards another guy. And then he tells this and it says the words in verse 31 of David were reported to the king Saul. And he sent for David. David was the only person talking about taking this guy down. So verse 32 says that David said to the king, let no man's heart fail because of this giant. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Pretty big promise right there. Watch what the king response, what his response was. He says, uh, you're not able. Say it with me, you're not able. It's very important here. He says, you're not able to go against this Philistine and fight with him. You are very young, and this man of war has been a champion since he was young. And I want to be honest, if David didn't do what he just getting ready to say, the, the, the conversation would have stopped. If what I'm going to teach you today, if David wasn't this type of shepherd king, this conversation would have been, I got it. And the king would have said, no, you don't. And if he had no resume of what his history did, I want to let you know that it's your history with God that gives you a resume for your destiny with God. You're not able to do it. He's like, no, I am. I am able. How? Well, he says this. Well, I'll tell you why I should go. Listen, just hear me out. Hear me out, king. He says, I, I used to keep my father's sheep. And one of the lions or the bears came and took a lamb out of the flock. A lamb is a sheep that's under one years old. Okay? And when they take a lamb out of the flock, I would catch it by its beard. And I would strike it. And I would kill it. First of all, I want to say a couple of things. If I'm killing a lion or a bear, I'm going to figure out another way to kill it other than grabbing its beard. Can we agree on that this morning? Sometimes we read the Bible and we don't even contextualize how scary this is. This is terrifying. He grabbed the little baby lamb, so I chased the bear down. I grabbed him by the beard, and I killed him. And then there was another time, same thing, but it was a lion yeah. by the beard. <laughs> and I killed it. And the king's impressed, like, okay. <laughs> All this beard and lion talk, bear and lion talk. He goes, he, he goes on, he says, I've killed lions and I've killed bears, and this uncircumcised giant is going to be like one of them. You know why? Because he's defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will also deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. Yeah. He was like, Yoda, may the force be with you, right? It's crazy. It's pretty wild that he would give him permission to go. Why would he let him go? Because of his resume. Yeah. I want to talk to you today about being a great shepherd king. I actually think it requires you to either be crazy yeah. or crazy in love. Yeah. That's my title today. Crazy? are crazy in love. Let's pray. God, we love you. I pray you meet us here today in a significant way. I ask you that you would raise up a generation of people that have the heart of the good shepherd. I pray that we would be the answer to somebody else's prayer. And I'm asking that God, through this church and other great churches all over this state, 
you would raise up an army of men and women that know how to take good care of your wandering sheep. Father, I pray today that we'd slay Goliaths, and I pray that we'd see victory in the land. In Jesus Christ's name, if you believe it, shout a good amen. amen. Have you ever had, like, more confidence in your mind at what you would do in a situation than you actually did when the situation came to pass? Have you ever told yourself that if something happened like this, I would act this way? Only to find the situation happen and you're like, I did the opposite? I'm not proud to say this today. But when I was in high school, we used to go to Malibu all the time. I grew up loving dolphins. I watched Flipper. Loved dolphins. Liked the ocean. And my buddies and I in high school, we go to Malibu all the time, and our, our customers, we'd get to the beach, we would smash a, an energy drink, which, thank God, I don't drink those anymore. Yeah. I would run to the point in Malibu, and then we'd run back, it's about a mile, we'd grab our board, and we'd start paddling out. And I was in like, I was, back then, I was in good shape, come on. <laughs> back then, the good old days. So I beat all my friends. I remember grabbing the board, just, just it's a rare occasion. And I grab my board, and I start paddling out, and I'm kind of going out and just ripping as fast as I can. And I'm watching my buddies, seeing how far behind they are. And I kid you not, I, I always thought that dolphins wouldn't be scary. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking backwards, and I, I, I start to turn my head, and I come over this wave. And as the wave's coming down, I turn around, and flipper's right here. Yeah. Yeah. I always said, like, look, sharks are scary. Yeah. Yeah. Dolphins are just, like, cute. You ever seen a 2,000-pound fish? Like face-to-face? I'm like, those teeth, you could eat flesh with those teeth. I'm not proud to say this, but I screamed. (laughs) I did. I screamed. I turned around. I paddled way faster in. All my buddies, they they looked like they they were scareder than I was. They saw I was petrified. They go, Mark, was it a great white? Like, nah, man. <laughs> no, scary though. It was big. It's like, what was it? I was like, it was a dolphin. <laughs> and they did what you did, which hurts my feelings. <laughs> I wasn't ready for it. Yeah. Yeah. Only thing scarier than a dolphin was uh, I remember I was at a youth camp, spoke in Big Bear. Uh, probably years later, I was at this camp. And so last night at camp, we're in Big Bear. and. Uh, We finished the last service. There was a big parking lot by our cabins and then a couple trees and a big field. We just finished this powerful service. I was probably the oldest, the oldest person leading there. The youth pastors were in charge. They were younger leaders. And the night before, I slept in the cabin. We're in the parking lot. And I'm telling the story from the night before of how I was in my bunk bed. The room was 100 and hell degrees. I opened the window to get some fresh air. And about 3 in the morning, I hear banging in front of the dumpster right out of my window. And I woke up and there was a baby bear. Remember seeing this bear, it was like the size of a dog, but I'm like, that's still a bear. So I kind of closed the window a little bit. (laughs) Not proud to say that. (laughs) So I'm in the parking lot, true story, and I'm telling everybody, youth pastor, and there's like three other people I'm telling the story to, and I'm like, last night, my room over here, there was a bear that went in this trash can and I point over here, and um, I realized they call it big bear for a reason. I pointed to where the bear was last night, the little bear. Little bear was gone. There was a bear. Now, I've been told there's no grizzlies in California. I beg to differ. I'm I'm not lying today. I I take creative liberty sometimes. I'm not lying. This bear was as tall as me on all fours. And he's staring at us. He's probably from me to the cameraman. This is a true story. You can ask Dan Fernandez, a couple other guys, Wendell Jake. We're st- I, I look over, he looks at us, I look at him, and my heart starts to race. Yeah. This all happened in a, mega, like a millisecond. Yeah. Thankfully, the youth pastor's car was there. Unfortunately, it was a Mini Cooper. Yeah. We jumped into that flour tortilla. Yeah. The bear's like, I like flour tortillas. Yeah. It was the scariest thing. That bear was so big. I read this story, and I I couldn't help the burden that God put in my heart. The only reason that the king in Israel let David fight was because of his resume of fighting a bear and a lion. Okay, I want to take a little bit deeper. You guys with me today? 
The only reason, you ever thought about this? He fought the lion and he fought that bear was because one of his lambs was in their mouth. Now, I'm not proud to say this this morning, but if I'm a shepherd and I got thousands of little lambs and one of them gets taken by a grizzly bear, Now, you're, you're, you're making fun of me. You're like, you're a shepherd. I am a shepherd. Yeah. I'll do that for people. Yeah. If, it's a, if it's like a cat or something, though, <laughs> I mean, I've heard it said that cats, like dogs prepare you for babies. Cats prepare you for teenage girls. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> Tough crowd. <laughs> Just joking. This is a joke. But I'm not, I'm, I'm serious. I, I contextualize this. David was either crazy. You, can you imagine Saul's like, wait, you? You had a lamb get taken by a bear and you uh, went after the bear right, yeah. for a baby sheep? Yeah. David, don't you know that you're, you only have one life? Right. Don't you know that like you have other sheep and you're going to risk everything to go after a bear? Yeah. What are you thinking? And I want to let you know today that before you ever step into your destiny... There will be fights in private that will set the stage for what God will do publicly. We have a generation that does not know how to step into their public destiny because they've never stewarded their private battles. There was a private battle. Ladies and gentlemen, I would be so disappointed. I got to be very honest today. I'm carnal today. But if I killed a bear or a lion, it better be on social media. David's greatest victory wasn't documented. No one was there when the grizzly fell. No one, can you imagine the picture of David holding a lion's beard? Lamb in one hand, bear in the other hand. <laughs> I'm blessing myself. It's crazy. No footage of it. But there was history. I don't know why. I, I felt so strong. I couldn't, I couldn't shake this thought. People probably heard when David said that, setting the stage to fight Goliath, and said, what did you do? You, you, you went after a bear? You went after a lion? Like, the proudest thing I've probably ever done is uh, I was washing the car a, a couple months ago in the driveway, and my dog was out there, and a coyote came by. I chased that coyote off felt like David. <laughs> that's right. You tell your friends about me. <laughs> it's crazy. I can't even imagine going after a bear for an animal that's replaceable. Why would God elevate a king that was a shepherd? I actually think it was in the answer of what everyone was talking about. Are you serious? You chased a bear down for a lamb? Okay, you did that one time. Okay, listen, the only thing that's crazier than chasing a bear down to rescue a lamb is after you do that and survive, it happens again with a lion. And I'll be honest, man. I'm like, look, lightning doesn't strike twice. God was kind the first time. I was crazy, call it testosterone. I got lost in the moment. But I was willing to risk my life with a bear. But listen, how crazy do you have to be to go, look, I, last time that bear took that thing, chased him down. This time, it was a lion. Like, God, can you pick any nicer animals? Like, I'm, I'm aware of the animal kingdom. If you're playing would you rather, I'm like, would you rather chase down a lion or a bear? I'm like, none. Give me flipper. Like, I'll outrun a dolphin, right? He'll outswim me. In a triathlon, it's going to come down who's the better cyclist. David, actually, are you still with me today? David uh, stepped into his destiny. And I, this is what I felt God prophetically saying to our church this week, is we're going to have a, a, a generation of men and women that know how to shepherd well because destiny is released when you show up to the stage to serve. I want to remind you, ladies and gentlemen, that David was anointed years earlier. 
the anointing, it poured on his life, but it didn't change his life. Samuel anointed him. Guess where he went? Right back to the sheep. But after he killed that giant, he would never again go back into the field with the sheep. Because there is fights that we, we step into that will release our destiny way more than just a good church service. There is things that we have to fight privately that set the stage for public victories. Some of you are not winning publicly because you are not winning privately. There is something in God. Listen, he actually bowed down. He grabbed five smooth stones out of the brook, and he ran towards the giant. This is the recipe of victory. It's bowing in the brook, and it's running after the giants. We don't have authority to run after giants until we learn the art of bowing to God in the brook. David becomes a victorious shepherd king. And guess what? He didn't show up that day to fight. He showed up that day to serve. And I really felt like some of you have never, never stepped into what God wants you to do because you're so focused on fighting and you're not interested in serving. I want to remind you that, that David had, he had uh, seven brothers. He was number eight. How many brothers? There's seven brothers. Three are in the battlefield. That means five are at home. That means he's the youngest of the five that are at home. And guess what? I bet you his dad asked all four brothers, take your brothers this pizza. And they all had excuses. Excuses. I'm too busy. I got kids sports. I have hobbies. I have vacations. I have all this opportunity. My, my greatest challenge sometimes with pastoring blessed people is sometimes people let the blessing of God bless them out of church. You love Jesus during the Great Recession. Everyone's in church when times are tough. But man, now business is good, and now I'm too busy to go honor God. Getting to get quiet up in the Presbyterian church. <laughs> David, he's not there to fight. You know what he did that? He showed up to serve. This is for someone today. You know he didn't show up to serve? He showed up to serve his brothers. Incidentally, it's brothers that didn't like him. I would say the hardest people to serve isn't your father, it's your peers. Sometimes it's easier to be about your father's business. But how is your attitude towards people that you normally want to compete with? Can you serve your peers? Or do you only kiss the butt of the people that can promote you? We have a lot of people that kiss butts to get ahead in life. But the true measure of service is how do you treat people that have nothing to offer you? How do you treat people that have nothing to give you? How do you talk to people that have nothing to add to you? It's easy to kiss someone's butt that has something to promote you with. He showed up that day not to serve just his father. He came to serve his brothers. He was about his father's business, but he was there to honor his brothers. There's service. You know, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 20 that the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to do the serving. He says that, look, in the world, everyone brags about how many servants they have. In the kingdom of God, we should brag about being the servants. He said it's better to do the serving than get to serving. You know what I learned is usually the quality of a restaurant and a hotel isn't its facilities. It's not even its food quality. A lot of times, it's its service. You ever been to a restaurant that's got a great ambiance? It's even got great food? Terrible service. It's a sad thing to have a great product with terrible service. Sad thing when you got a great facility but terrible service. It's a great thing that we value food more than we value people. I feel like preaching in here today. Do you know why people are drawn to the house of God? It's not because of the quality of our buildings. We've proven that. It's not the quality of what maybe what just a preacher says. It's the service. God is serving us. We're serving each other. We're serving one another. And I believe many of you will step into what God has called you to shepherd and lead. If you'll adopt today, say, God, I know you've given me strength not to brag but to serve. Given me money not to brag but to serve. Given me resources to help not to brag but to serve. There's a business guy in our church that said, Mark, I don't care how many people need a scholarship for our, our marriage conference. You tell me if money is an option and I'll write a check to cover the gap. 
This guy realizes that he has a gift to make money, and that money is not just for him. Yes, God is so kind, he'll let us enjoy what we have. But listen, he's fine as long as we don't let the money have us. People don't realize that God gives strength for service. God will give you the gift of compassion so you can feel things that nobody else feels. He'll give you the gift of wisdom to solve problems that no one else can solve. Why does God entrust us with strength? It's for service. David has this crazy love that would be willing to serve. It's crazy. Psalm 70 says that it's the shepherd, it's the integrity of the shepherd that actually shepherds the sheep. It's the integrity. So you can say it this way, that we are, we are fed with our wholeness or our integrity. Do you know what it means? Uh, integrity means completeness. It means whole, like, like whole foods. Who's been a whole paycheck? Who thinks you need a PhD to know which bin to throw your trash into? You know what's wild is David literally is willing to serve, but he's, he has a heart that's integrous, but he's more than just integrous to serve sheep. I mean, really? Like, lay your life down for a person, your child, your son, but an animal that's replaceable. Yeah. I just want to go on the record to say that if he didn't, if he didn't do what he did privately, when the king says, you're just a boy, he's a champion, go home. Yeah. You know what David would have done? He would have gone home. But because he had a story of a private value. You went after a bear and a lion. Here's what everyone said. Are you crazy? He's like, no. I'm crazy in love. You know what he did? Is he loved his father's sheep like they were his own kids. You know why God doesn't give more to many of you? Because you're not loving what you have. If you'll treat well what you currently have, God will give you more. It says he who has will be given. More will be given. If you're faithful with little, God will give you much. Problem why many of you are lacking much is because you're not faithful with little. We know he had little because his brother was taunting him and says, what are you doing here, you arrogant punk? Why are, who's watching your little group of sheep? He called his flock a little few flock. He was insulting him. And what I've learned is, is when you have a heart of humility, you'll serve people that will one day serve you. David had no idea, bro. Look, I'm going to be gracious to you because God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Some of you are too big right now to serve the people that one day might actually help you out. He got low in the brook before he got big in the valley. And we know this, that he served. Someone say serve. He was not only serving, he was set apart. How do you know he was set apart? Because David was good at a couple things. You know what David did to the world? David not only did he actually introduce worship to the world, we know how to clap in church. We know how to lift up holy hands. We know how to shout to God with a voice of triumph. We know how to kneel in church. You know why? That's all what David taught us. It's funny. There's denominations that say shouting and clapping and lifting up hands. That's what those charismaniacs do. It's not a charismatic idea. It's a Bible idea. Did you know that? David wrote, shout to God with a voice. Clap. Lift up holy hands. Kneel before the Lord. He actually says to lift up holy hands in the sanctuary. Makes it pretty clear. David introduces worship. David introduces us to what it means to really pray. And by the way, King David would actually be the greatest revealer of who Jesus Christ would be in the Old Testament. Outside of, outside of Isaiah, he writes more chapters about Jesus in the book of Psalms than anybody else in the Bible. David is an amazing man, but he was set apart. Someone say set apart. 1 Peter 2.9 says, but you are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You're God's special possession. That you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into a wonderful light. Everybody wants to make a difference, but nobody wants to be different. So funny. We're like, I want to make a difference, but I want to drink like everybody else drinks. I want to get high like everybody else gets high. I want to watch the same soft porn on Netflix that everybody else watches, but I want to be different in my workplace. You don't look different until you eat different. Getting quiet up in here today. I'm tired of people being addicted to things. I'm tired of us worshiping idols when God deserves all the glory. I'm tired of Costco having larger sections for alcohol than it has for food. And we're wondering why our families are blowing up. We're flirting with idols that God wants us to kill. 
And I'll tell you why you don't kill them, because some of you, you have a service. Some of you are sort of set apart, but you never deserve, you never develop the skills to be gentle with God and harsh with the enemy. This is what David did. David had skills. You read 1 Samuel chapter 16. It says that King Saul was vexed with a spirit from God that vexed his mind because God left him. And you know what they said? He said, let's find a man that knows how to play the harp skillfully. David wasn't just skillful with his instrument. He was skillful with his sling and wesson. That was an Idaho joke. He had a sling and wesson. This guy was gifted with his prayers. He was skilled with his worship. He was skilled with his slingshot. Can you imagine how skilled you'd have to be to actually, you'd have to, to actually offer a fatal blow to a bear while holding a lamb? How do you strike a bear that hard without killing the lamb? What type of surgical skill would you have to have to actually put a fatal blow on a lion and not damage the lamb? I think the problem in our society is, is we're gentle with our bad habits, but we're very harsh with the presence of God. Like we get more annoyed about a long church service than we do a long basketball game. Overtime in sports, glory. Overtime at church, get me out of here. I would say your appetite screwed up. I know, you're, I know you're sick because the first thing you lose when you're sick is your appetite. And when you're hungrier for entertainment than you are the glory of God, you're unhealthy. I'm offending a lot of people today. I like it. Ocean's Church is a place that you want to grow in your appetite for God. Man, I love what Bodhi was saying in a day. God, hunger for you. I thirst for you. You know who God fills up? Those that are hungering and thirsting. Some of you are empty because you have no appetite for God. But I love David because he goes, the band came up, I'm finished. Is he says... He says that he has skills. He has so much skills that he shows up that day. He grabs five smooth stones. I want to remind you that he never put stones. He put the stones in his shepherd's pouch. I like to think of it as a modern-day fanny pack. <laughs> He's got a shepherd's pouch. He grabs five smooth stones. We've all heard the story. Probably because he has four big brothers. Five giants. He was ready to go toe to toe with all five. It's interesting, though, that his his weapon was actually placed in his vocation. And I just felt strong that many of you are underestimating what God could do in your job. Do you know that you're shepherds at your workplace? God wants to put smooth stones in your daily life. We got too many people that romanticize being pastors and working at the church and underestimate what it looks like to be a businesswoman or a businessman with stones. That'll preach right there. <laughs> Bringing some stones to business. Little shepherd's pouch. And I love the fact that David goes on the record and says, look, the same God that delivered me from the Paul the Lion Paul the bear, he's going to deliver this guy into my hands. I believe that if we'll acknowledge that success comes from the Lord. Joshua 1.8 says, do not let the, this law, do not let God's word depart from your mouth, but meditate on it day and night. And if you would meditate on God's precepts, he says, you will be successful in all that you do. Some of you are successful in your money, but you're failing in your marriage. Some of you are successful in your marriage, but you're failing in your money. And the problem is, is that you need both integrity and skill. We have a generation that's starving to death with skills. You made a lot of money, but you're dead spiritually because you have no spiritual integrity. And we have people that are spiritually integrous, but starving financially because you have no skills. I'm telling you, you can be devoted to God and still not be skillful. And you can be skillful in life and not devoted to God. I believe that God will, God will raise up shepherds that do both. We value the wisdom of God, but we value the power of God. Power is sovereign. Wisdom is skills. I heard Rick Warren once say that you could be a dedicated fisherman and never catch a fish. Because dedication doesn't catch fish. Skills do. I know people that fast 40 days and 40 nights. 
but there's no one that shows up to their church. The church isn't empty because he's preaching heresy. It's empty because he has no skills. You can be devoted with no skills. And you can have skills with zero devotion. A lot of churches land in that camp today. They have great programs. They've learned how to build great churches without God's presence. I don't want to get so skilled that I can do it without God. David models, God, I'll give my best to you. I'll learn to play my harp. I'll learn to sling the, sh the shots. But God, ultimately, you're the one that delivers. He knew where his help came from. David lost his way when he went on the run from Saul. He went into the, the priest temple and it says, I have no weapons. I need a sword. And the big mistake that David made is he went after using the weapon of the giant that he killed. He went and grabbed the sword of the giant. We don't need the weapons of the Philistines. God has given us a weapon. God has developed us in our caves. He's developed us in our deserts. And I'm telling you right now, that we have a generation that wants to fight good without learning how to serve well. It's in the service that our destiny is released. People want to be great on platforms before they're, they're loving with people in private. God gives public stages to those that care about the one lamb privately. You risked your life for one little animal? Are you crazy? Yeah, I'm crazy. I'm crazy to leverage my gifts to serve. I'm crazy to be set apart for God. Yeah, I'm crazy. I'm actually crazy to actually develop my skills. I'm crazy because I want to be successful and give God all the glory for it. You're right, I'm crazy. I believe God's raising up a generation of men and women, from school teachers to CEOs, from stay-at-home moms and dads, to those that are running big businesses that are actually saying, God, I need your smooth stones to go with me into my workplace. God's raising up shepherd kings, shepherding kings. I look around our church. We have a church full of giant killers. So many of you, you guys run big, big enterprises and you have successful careers and you have amazing spouses and crazy, amazing kids. And I'm telling you that God is raising you up crazy love shepherd your region I'm praying for you today that God would give you a desire to have crazy love ultimately the story of David I'll wrap this up the story of David is love for lambs that's what it is there was three lambs that there was love for there was love for a baby lamb that got taken by a bear and a lion and then the, re the reason why he killed Goliath that day wasn't just because he saved that lamb he killed Goliath that day because he actually was offended at Goliath attacking his lamb. How dare you talk about my God? And he didn't just value the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He realized that he was God's sheep. How do we know that? Because David says, the Lord is my... He knew that he was God's lamb. And I believe most people don't live with crazy love because they lack one of those lambs. Some of you understand that God is the lamb that you worship, but you don't have a good self-image because you don't realize that you are God's lamb. And his thoughts towards you are good thoughts, give you a future and a hope. Some of you know God is the lamb of God, and some of you know that God, is, God views you as his lamb, but some of you don't realize that that guy that you're mean to every day, that's one of God's lambs. That person that doesn't vote like you, that's God's lamb. That person that dresses differently than you, that, that preacher that doesn't really wear socks you can see, my eyes are up here today. God loves that guy. God loves that woman. I felt like God just wanted me to tell you a very simple message today that God raised up David because he had a crazy love to serve, a crazy love to be set apart, a crazy love to give his life to develop his gifts, but a crazy love to never forget that it's not his skills, it's not his devotion, and it's not even, it's not even his service, but success comes neither from the east or from the west. Success comes from the Lord. Just stand on your feet today. It's crazy. You see people drive those rally cars on the crit on the on those roads next to cliffs. Some say they're crazy. 
Others would say they're crazy in love with driving. People surf 100 foot waves. They say those guys are crazy. They probably are. But they're crazy about what they do. Guys jump dirt bikes over football fields. Crazy, yeah, probably. But they're crazy in love with what they do. And I just really believe if we're gonna look like God in the world, the world must, I'm just, I just feel like someone somewhere in your life should say, are you crazy? Why would you live your life that way? I spent five years of my life in Boise, Idaho. The first five years as a Christian, cleaning toilets, vacuuming carpets, as I was going through Bible college and working at a deli part-time. All my friends were getting their, their uh, they, they were taking their, their LSATs, they were taking the MCATs, they were playing in the National Football League. All my buddies were doing great things and they would ask me, Mark, what are you doing with your life? You were the winter ball king. You were the popular one out of all of us. You were the one that everyone thought was gonna do something great. What are you doing? I'm like, vacuuming carpets, scrubbing toilets, locking my church up every day of the week. One of my biggest responsibilities, I had to make sure the church was secure every night. So I would walk in there, I had about a thousand keys, because janitors are bad at the bone. Keys give you access, can I get an amen? I get into any room in the church. I would walk around at night. I was so bad to the bone, I'd walk around in the dark. Massive building, locking everything up. And after I finished all the exterior doors, I'd walk into our auditorium. About 1,100 seats in that auditorium. It has 45 foot ceilings. I would walk in there at 11, 12, one o'clock at night. And for 30 minutes to an hour, sometimes two hours, three hours, I would just pray. I learned how to hear the voice of God in an empty, dark auditorium. I, I learned the skill. I learned being set apart. I learned what it looks like to serve God when no one was looking. Some of you are like, man, where did you learn how to prophesy, Mark? In an empty auditorium when I was a janitor. Where did you learn how to lead a great church? In an empty church building. God told me if I could take care of toilets, I could take care of people. If I could keep toilets clean, I could keep people clean. And today, many people benefit from what Rochelle and I gave ourselves to in that season. Why should we let you fight Goliath in Orange County? Because I killed a Goliath in, in Boise, Idaho. We saw revival at Boise State University. 12 college students turned into 2,000 college students. We saw 18,000 decisions for Jesus in nine years. Became the chaplain of the football team. People say, you surprised at what's happening in California? I'm like, no. It's exactly what happened in Idaho, but just bigger. It's no longer just 18 to 24 year olds, now it's all ages. And it's no longer happening in cold baptism tanks in the winter time, now it's happening on the beaches of Southern California. God will give you Goliaths when you love the lamb enough to go after the bears and the lions. I actually don't think, because you have to be crazy. Listen, David was either crazy in love with the sheep or he had no respect for his own life. Why would you go after a lion or a bear? Do you have a death wish? No. I have a great love for what my father's entrusted to my care. Do you know that that lamb wasn't even his sheep? It was his dad's. And I believe that if we'll love what God has given us like it's our own, God will give us more of it. Would you close your eyes today? I'm out of time. I feel like there's a crazy love coming into our church crazy love not to flee from the Goliaths, a crazy love not to give up when a bear and a lion takes our child, takes our niece, when the bear attacks our marriage, when the lion attacks our business. We're not going to be a bunch of quitters in this church, but I thank you that God today we're going to be set apart. We're going to run not to the battle to fight. We're going to run, we're going to rush in to serve. And I thank you that we're going to develop our skills. If we're welders, we're going to weld for you. If we're engineers, we're gonna engineer for you. If we're architects, we're gonna design for you. If we're educators, we're gonna educate for you. God, I pray today, if, we, if we're entrepreneurs, we're gonna do it for you. Today, Lord, if you're here in this atmosphere and you wanna to respond to the great God that's inviting you to, to come to a new level of crazy love to serve. How many say, Mark, I wanna serve God in a greater way? Just lift your hands in this place. How many say, Mark, I wanna be more set apart to the things of God? Lift your hands in this place. How many would even say, Mark, I want to I develop my skills. 
Some of you have been burying your talents in the ground. And God says it's time to stop burying and start trading. It's time to start using your gifts for the King of Kings. And there's many of you here today that your, your stream of success is dried up because God gave you success, but you never acknowledged Him in your success. And if you don't acknowledge God in your success, eventually that stream will dry up and you'll end up at the brook that started it all off. I pray this morning, Lord Jesus, you would meet every man and every woman right where they're at. If you want to grow in service to God with crazy love, just give God a wave offering right now. You want to grow today and be more set apart, God, set me apart for the great purpose that you have for my life. Just give God a wave offering right now. If you feel like there's some skills that God's asking you to start using for God. I texted one of our worship leaders that hasn't led in a long time this morning. And during worship today, I just grabbed my phone. I felt like God said, it's time to start dusting off that gift. Start using it for God again. Someone's been burying one of your gifts. It's time to unbury it and start using the skills, the things that God's given you. Grab your neighbor's hand right now all over this tent. People are responding to God. Just pray this prayer over your neighbor today. Say, Lord Jesus, I pray for my neighbor on both sides. Give him a crazy love. A love so wild, it would serve everyone around him. A love so crazy, he would be set apart. Not only set apart, but skillful. A love that would lead them into great success. Deliver him from the paw of the bear, the paw of the lion, and prepare them for their Goliath. In Jesus' name. You know, Goliath didn't kill David, he revealed David. That's what giants do. That battle actually wasn't, it wasn't bad for him, it was a blessing. It was the battle that he fought that prepared him for his life. Some of you are in the fight of your life right now, and I just like the Lord says, that victory unlocks your destiny. It's a phrase that one of my mentors used to say, he says, Mark, we're opportunity meets preparation that's when we step into our destiny David had an opportunity we always think that opportunities are gonna come looking like a six-figure or seven-figure check opportunities usually come ten feet tall wearing overalls and look like work but when you take that opportunity with the preparation and you put the two together it's crazy how those skills and that service and that it just unlocks success. So I pray right now, last two things we do today. If you're here and you're like, Mark, to be honest with you, I'm not living my life for Jesus, but I want to. I've been away from God. I've never known Jesus. Maybe somewhere along the way, you got off track. Your heart's beating out of your chest. There was 12 here first service. There was more at San Juan, more online. Today there's many that say, Mark, I want to I want to kill the Goliaths. I, I want to kill the bear and the lions. I, I can't do it without God. Everybody else was talking about Goliath. David was God intoxicated. Eyes closed, heads bowed. Today, Mark, I want to get right with God. For the first time, I want to put my faith in Jesus. I'm going to count to three. Would we'll you just raise your hand right now if you want to give your life back to God? first time put your faith in God just put it up real high there's hands going up all over I'll give you three seconds one there's more hands going up two keep it up keep it up it's okay keep it up one more time real high three I'm not gonna embarrass you just put it real high keep it up keep it up real high one two real high three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen anybody else at least fourteen fifteen anybody else sixteen seventeen eighteen 19 in the very back, 20 in the very back, love it, all right, now everyone look at me today, who's been to a wedding before, would you give me a wave, been to a wedding, who remembers at the wedding, the last thing they do is two people exchange vows, can I ask you a question, after they say their vows, is that the end of their relationship, or is it the beginning, many people have a, a wrong picture of Christianity, they think they pray a prayer when they raise their hands and now they're like i'm going to heaven i'm never going to talk to god again the rest of my life it's not the way this works this is the altar that we say god from here out 
I'm living with you. I'm talking with you. I'm living for you. All over the room today with those people that raised their hands, would you pray this prayer? Would you say, Jesus, today I come to you inviting you into my life. There's giants, there's bears, there's lions, but you're king over all. Holy Spirit, I invite you today to set me apart for your service. Show me my skills and how I can use them to honor you. Today, I'm inviting Jesus Christ to be the leader, Savior, Lord of my life. I pray you'd heal me, fill me, and forgive me now. Last things we pray for, say, Jesus, I ask you for a love for your word, a love to read it, and a love to talk to you in prayer. I ask you for a church to plant my, my life in. And I ask you for friends that know you better than I do, that can show me your ways. Make me a shepherd to my family, my friends, my community. In Jesus Christ's name, give me a crazy love. If you love this morning, come on, say amen. Almost finished here. Let's give God one big roar. That's awesome. That's a lot of people today. A lot of people today. This is so cool, man. Someone just prayed that prayer. You're crying. Your heart's pounding out of your chest. You would say, I've never felt this before. That's God. You know what's so cool? God's healing someone. The first word I heard when I woke up this morning, literally from dead sleep to waking up, I heard femur. And God told me he was going to heal someone today that had a femur issue. A lady came up to me after first service said she invited a friend that gave his life to the Lord today and he had just broken his femur and God would just touch his leg as he saved his soul I believe there's many that need a healing today as God did a miracle for Carlo as God did a miracle for Iman I could go around this room as God did a miracle for my friend Ron I go around this room there's so many people I look around this room that have been healed in this church did you know that Noah, he was born with a lifelong thyroid condition. Doctors had him on medication since he was a little kid, said he would never be free from this medication. And in a service like this, I said, God is healing someone's thyroid. His dad, Paul, leaned over and he said, son, I think that's you. And wouldn't you know it, Noah would go to the doctor, they would run his test and say, you no longer need your, your thyroid medication. We don't know how it changed. We don't know what happened to your body. There's no medical explanation. It's a miracle. Today, I can go around this room. Why is this church growing? Because God's meeting us. So if you need a touch in your body, a little out of time, pop your hand up. That's the last thing I'll do. I need a touch from God, physically, mentally. Well, I've raised my hand before. I would keep raising it until you get results. I never stopped going to the gym when I didn't get a six-pack. My lack of results motivated me to come back for more. I think that the lack of result in prayer should motivate us to go further into the throne room. Someone's hands up next to you. Put your hand on their shoulder. You know the Drill Oceans Church. Last thing we do this morning is we pray for these people. Come on, with all the faith that you have in your spirit today, say, Jesus today. It's like you mean it. Jesus today. Right now. We invite you top of their head to the bottom of their feet. Holy Spirit, we speak your life, your presence, your, your power, gifts of miracles, gifts of healing. Right now, you said we would lay hands on the sick and they would recover. Recover now in Jesus' name. I want you to prophesy, recover now. In Jesus' name, body come alive, spirit of infirmity be bound, miracles, signs, wonders, right now, in Jesus Christ's name. Do it again, and again, and again, for your glory. And all of God's kids said, can we just honor Jesus today with a good hand clap?